Hey guys and welcome back to Revisiting Archive, your gateway to the past. In this special episode marking a milestone in our Spanish history series, we embark on an epic journey through the entirety of Spain's rich and complex history. From the early civilizations that shaped the Iberian Peninsula to the modern era, we'll unravel the threads of Spain's past that have woven the tapestry of its present. Join us as we explore the pivotal moments, legendary figures, and transformative events that have defined the captivating story of Spain. Get ready to witness history come alive in our comprehensive exploration of the complete history of Spain. Let's get started. The Iberian Peninsula is the southwesternmost part of Europe, bordered by the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. It is currently divided into Spain, Portugal, Andorra, and a small part of France. However, in ancient times it was home to many different peoples and cultures, who left behind a rich and varied archaeological legacy. The first human presence in the Iberian Peninsula dates back to the Paleolithic period when anatomically modern humans arrived from Africa around 35,000 BCE. They coexisted with another human species, the Neanderthals, who had been living in Europe for hundreds of thousands of years. The Neanderthals eventually became extinct around 30,000 BCE, leaving behind some traces of their culture and genes in modern humans. The Paleolithic humans were hunter-gatherers who adapted to the changing climate and environment of the peninsula. They made tools from stone, bone and antler and created art on cave walls, rocks and objects. Some of the most famous examples of Paleolithic art in Spain are the paintings of Altamira Cave in Cantabria which depict animals such as bison, horses and deer, and sculptures of El Castillo cave in Asturias, which include a human face and a bison head. The Paleolithic period ended around 10,000 BCE, when the last ice age gave way to a warmer and wetter climate. This led to the development of the Mesolithic period, when humans began to exploit new resources such as fish, selfish, and plants. They also developed new technologies such as microliths, small stone blades, bows and arrows and pottery, they also continued to produce art such as the engravings of Cueva de los Casaras in Guadalajara, I probably butchered that name, I hope you can forgive me, <laughs> which shows scenes of hunting and fishing. The Mesolithic period lasted until around 5000 BCE, when humans began to adopt agriculture and animal husbandry as the main source of food. This marked the beginning of the Neolithic period when humans settled in permanent villages and developed new skills such as weaving, metalworking and writing. They also built megalithic monuments such as dolmens, menhirs and cromlechs. Some of the most impressive megalithic sites in Spain are Los Milares in Almeria, which was a fortified settlement with more than 100 dolmens, Antiquera in Malaga, which has several dolmens and a large menhir, and Dombate in A Coruña which has a complex dolmen with carved stones. The Neolithic period also saw the arrival of new peoples and cultures from other regions of Europe and Africa. One of these was the Beaker culture which spread across Western Europe between 2800 and 1800 BCE. The Beaker people were characterized by their distinctive pottery vessels which they used for drinking and ritual purposes. They also included new technologies such as copper metallurgy wheel pottery and horse domestication. They also influenced the local cultures with their customs and beliefs. Another important culture that emerged in the Iberian Peninsula was the Iberian culture, which developed between 1200 and 218 BCE. The name Iberia was given by the ancient Greek and Roman writers, who described them as a diverse group of people who lived in the eastern and southern parts of the peninsula. The Iberians spoke various languages that belonged to a different family than the Indo-European languages spoken by most Europeans. They also had their own writing system, the Iberian script, which consisted of signs that represented syllables or consonants. The Iberians were organized into tribes or city-states that had their own political and social structures. They were mainly farmers and herders who cultivated cereals, vines, olives and fruits. They also traded with other people, such as the Phoenicians, the Greeks, the Carthaginians, and the Romans. They exchanged goods such as metal, textiles, wine, oil, salt, fish, and horses. They also adopted some elements of their culture such as writing, religion, art, and architecture. The Iberians were known for their artistic and technological achievements. 
They produced fine pottery, jewelry, weapons, and sculptures. They also built impressive fortifications, sanctuaries, and necropolises. Some of the most remarkable examples of the Iberian art and culture are the Lady of Elche, a stone bust of a woman wearing a complex headdress, the treasure of Carambolo, a collection of gold objects decorated by geometric and animal motifs, the Bija of Balazote, a bronze sculpture of a hybrid creature with a human head and a bull's body, the sanctuary of Cerro de los Santos, a hilltop shrine with hundreds of stone statues of deities and animals, and the necropolis of Tutugi, a cemetery with elaborate tombs and grave goods. The Iberians were also involved in many wars and alliances with other cultures. They fought against the Celts, who lived in the northern and western parts of the peninsula. The Celts were another group of Indo-European peoples who spoke Celtic languages and had their own culture and religion. They also built megalithic monuments such as dolmens and menhirs. They also fought against the Carthaginians, who tried to expand their empire from North Africa to Spain. The Carthaginians were descendants of the Phoenicians, who had established colonies along the eastern coast of Spain since the 9th century BCE. The Carthaginians were led by Hannibal, who used Spain as his base to attack Rome during the Second Punic War. The Iberians also fought against the Romans, who invaded Spain in 218 BCE to stop Hannibal's advance. The Romans were a powerful civilization that ruled over most of Europe and the Mediterranean. The Romans conquered most of Spain by 19 BCE. After defeating the Iberians and their allies in several battles and sieges, the Roman conquest marked the end of the prehistory and Iberian civilization of the Iberian Peninsula and the beginning of a new era of Romanization. The Romans imposed their language, Latin, law, Roman law, religion, the Roman paganism, culture, Roman art and literature, and administration, the Roman provinces, on the Iberian people. However, they also respected some aspects of their local traditions and customs. The Romans also faced resistance from some groups who refused to submit to their rule, such as the Cantabrians, the Asturians, the Lusitanians, and the Numantines. This was a period of expansion, warfare, and cultural exchange that shaped the history of Europe, Africa, and Asia. The Roman Republic was founded in the 6th century BCE after overthrowing the Etruscan kings who ruled over Rome. The Romans gradually expanded their territory by conquering their neighbors, such as the Latins, the Sabines, the Etruscans, the Volsci, and the Samnites. They also fought against foreign invaders, such as the Gauls, who sacked Rome in 390 BCE, and the Greeks, who challenged Rome's dominance in southern Italy. One of Rome's most formidable enemies was Carthage, a powerful city-state in North Africa that controlled a vast maritime empire. Carthage and Rome fought three wars, known as the Punic Wars between 264 and 146 BCE. The First Punic War was mainly a naval conflict over Sicily, which ended with Rome's victory and Carthage's cession of Sicily to Rome. The Second Punic War was triggered by Carthage's expansion into Spain, which threatened Rome's interests. The most famous episode of this war was Hannibal's invasion of Italy through the Alps with his army and elephants. Hannibal inflicted several defeats on the Roman at Trebia, Lake Trasimene, and Cannae. But he could not capture Rome or break its alliances. The Romans eventually turned the tide by sending Scipio Africanus to invade Africa and defeat Hannibal at Zama in 202 BCE. The Third Punic War was a short and brutal siege of Carthage by the Romans, who razed the city to the ground and enslaved its population in 146 BCE. The destruction of Carthage marked the end of Rome's major rival in the Mediterranean and the beginning of its imperial expansion. Rome annexed many territories from its former enemies, such as Spain, Gaul, Greece, Macedonia, Asia Minor, Syria, Egypt, and North Africa. Rome also faced new challenges from other peoples and cultures, such as the Parthians in Persia, the Germans in Northern Europe, and the Jews in Judea. The Roman conquest brought many benefits to the conquered regions, such as peace, stability, trade, infrastructure, law, citizenship, and culture. The Romans built roads, aqueducts, bridges, temples, theaters, baths, and monuments throughout their empire. They also spread their language, which was Latin, and their religion, which was polytheism. Literature, such as Virgil's Aeneid, and art, such as mosaics and sculptures, and also philosophy, such as Stoicism. The Romans also assimilated many aspects of the culture they encountered, such as Greek mythology, Egyptian cults, Persian astrology, and Jewish monotheism. 
However, the Roman conquest also brought many problems to both the conquerors and the conquered. The Romans had to deal with constant wars against external enemies, such as Mithridates VI of Pontus, Spartacus, Vercingetorix, Baudica, Arminius, Zenobia, Shapur I, etc., and internal rivals such as Sulla, Pompey, Caesar, Antony, Octavian, etc. The Romans also had to cope with social unrest such as slave revolts, economic crisis such as inflation, political corruption such as bribery, moral decay such as decadence, religious conflicts such as persecution, and cultural diversity such as barbarization. The Roman conquest reached its peak under Emperor Trajan in 117 CE when the empire stretched from Britain to Mesopotamia. However, after Trajan's death, the empire began to decline due to various factors. Military defeats such as Adrianople, civil wars such as the Severus, plagues such as Antonine Plague, invasions such as Goths, reforms such as Diocletian's Tetrarchy, splits such as Constantine's division, conversions such as Constantine's Christianity, migrations such as Huns, sackings such as Alaric's raid. The Roman conquest ended in 409 CE, when the Visigoths under King Alaric II established their kingdom in Spain after defeating the Romans at Buile. The Visigoths were one of the many Germanic tribes that had crossed the Rhine and the Danube and settled in various parts of the Roman Empire. They were followed by other tribes such as the Franks, the Vandals, the Burgundians, the Ostrogoths, and Lombards. These tribes eventually established their own kingdoms on the ruins of the Roman Empire, giving rise to the medieval period. The Visigoths were originally one of the branches of the Goths, a nomadic people who originated from Scandinavia and migrated southward in search of new lands. The Goths split into two groups, the Ostrogoths, who settled in Eastern Europe and the Visigoths, who settled in the Balkans. The Visigoths came into contact with the Roman Empire in the late 4th century CE, when they were attacked by another nomadic people, the Huns. The Visigoths sought refuge in the Roman territory and were allowed to cross the Danube River as allies of the Romans. However, they soon rebelled against the harsh treatment of the Roman officials and waged war against the Empire. The Visigoths achieved a stunning victory over the Romans at the Battle of Adrianople in 378 CE, where they killed the Emperor Valens and his army. The new Emperor Theodosius I managed to pacify them by granting them lands in Moesia, the modern Bulgaria, as federates, or allies who had to provide military service in exchange for protection and autonomy. It was apparently during this period that the Visigoths converted to Aryan Christianity a form of Christianity that differed from the Orthodox Nicene Christianity of the Romans. Arianism taught that Jesus Christ was not equal to God the Father, but was created by Him. This doctrine was considered heretical by most Christians and caused conflicts between the Visigoths and the Roman hosts. The most famous leader of the Visigoths was Alaric I, who became the king in 395 CE. Alaric led his people on a series of raids across Greece and Italy, seeking more lands and resources for his growing population. He also wanted to secure a permanent settlement for his people within the Roman Empire. In 410 CE, Alaric achieved his greatest feat. He sacked Rome, the capital of the Western Roman Empire. This was a shocking event that marked the decline of the Roman power and prestige. Alaric died shortly after his triumph and was buried under a riverbed with his treasure. After Alaric's death, his successor, Atolphus, moved the Visigoths to Gaul, which is modern France, where they established a kingdom with Toulouse as their capital. They also expanded their influence into Spain, where they fought against other Germanic tribes such as the Vandals and Suebi. In 418 CE, the Visigoths entered into Foederati agreement with the Romans, recognizing their rule over southwestern Gaul and parts of Spain. Now, let's fast forward to the year 507 CE. The Visigothic king, Alaric II, faced a formidable adversary in the form of the Frankish king, Clovis I, in the Battle of Vouillet. Clovis I defeated the Visigoths and pushed them further into the Iberian Peninsula. This marked a turning point for the Visigoths. As they solidified their rule in Spain, they established their capital at Toledo and gradually assimilated with the local Hispano-Roman population. The Visigothic kingdom underwent significant transformations during this time, adopting Roman law and administration while retaining their Aryan Christian beliefs. One of the most influential figures of this era 
was King Liu Weigild. He sought to strengthen royal authority and centralize power, which led to internal tensions and conflicts within the aristocracy. But Liu Weigild was not just a ruler. He was also a patron of culture and learning. His reign witnessed a flourishing of art, literature, and religious debates. In 589 CE, a pivotal event occurred that reshaped the religious landscape of the Visigothic Kingdom. King Recared I converted to Nicene Christianity, aligning the Visigoths with the orthodox beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church. This marked the end of Arianism among the Visigoths and contributed to the cultural integration of the Germanic rulers with the Hispano-Roman population. However, the Visigothic Kingdom faced challenges from within and outside. The nobility's resistance to centralization and external threats from Byzantine forces and Islamic expansion tested the stability of the kingdom. It was during this time of vulnerability that a crucial event occurred, the Islamic conquest of Spain. In 711 CE, the Islamic general Tariq ibn Ziyad crossed the Strait of Gibraltar with his forces, landing on the Iberian Peninsula. The Visigothic forces, led by King Roderick, confronted them at the Battle of Guadalete. This battle marked the beginning of the end for Visigothic rule in Spain, as the Islamic forces gained a foothold on the peninsula. The Islamic conquest brought an end to the Visigothic kingdom and ushered in the era of Al-Andalus. Over the next centuries, the Islamic rulers would leave an indelible mark on the culture, architecture, and history of Spain. And so, our journey through the Germanic invasions and Visigothic rule comes to a close. This era was one of upheaval, transformation, and cultural exchange that laid the foundation for the rich tapestry of Spanish history. Let's dive into the history of Al-Andalus, the name used by the Muslim population of the Iberian Peninsula for the territory that was under Muslim rule for almost eight centuries. The Islamic conquest of Spain began in 711 CE when the Muslim army led by Tariq ibn Ziyad crossed the Strait of Gibraltar and defeated the Visigothic king Roderick at the Battle of Guadalete. This opened the way for further Muslim invasions, which soon conquered most of Spain and Portugal with little resistance. The Muslims established the Umayyad Caliphate in the Iberian Peninsula, which they called Al-Andalus, meaning the land of the Vandals, a Germanic tribe that had occupied the region in the 5th century. The Umayyad Caliphate was one of the largest and most powerful empires in history, stretching from Spain to India at its peak. It was also a center of culture, science, and art, where Muslims, Christians, and Jews coexisted in relative harmony and tolerance. The Umayyads built magnificent cities, mosques, palaces, and gardens in Al-Andalus, such as Cordoba, Seville, Granada, and Toledo. They also promoted learning and scholarship in various fields, such as astronomy, medicine, mathematics, philosophy, literature, and poetry. One of the most famous rulers of Al-Andalus was Abd al-Rahman III, who declared himself caliph in 929 CE and made Cordoba his capital. He was a patron of culture and learning, and under his reign, Cordoba became one of the most prosperous and civilized cities in the world, and had a population of over half a million people, many libraries, schools, hospitals, markets, and public baths. It also had a great mosque known as the Mesquita, which is still one of the most impressive monuments of Islamic architecture. However, the Umayyad Caliphate also faced many challenges and conflicts from within and without. It had to deal with rebellions from different ethnic and religious groups, such as the Berbers, who were the original inhabitants of North Africa and Spain, the Muladi, who were Muslims of Hispanic origin, and the Mozarabs, who were Christians who adopted Arabic culture but kept their faith. It also had to face external threats from rival Muslim dynasties, such as the Fatimids in North Africa and Egypt, the Abbasids in Iraq and Persia, and the Seljuks in Anatolia and Syria. The Umayyad Caliphate collapsed in 1031 CE, due to internal divisions and civil wars. Al-Andalus was then divided into small kingdoms known as Taifas, which were often at war with each other. This weakened their defense against the Christian kingdoms in the north of Spain. The fragmentation of Al-Andalus into Taifas made it vulnerable to the growing power of the Christian kingdoms in the north, such as Castile, Aragon, and Leon. These Christian states saw the disunity among the Muslims as an opportunity to reclaim territory that had been lost during the Islamic conquest. The Reconquista, a series of military campaigns and battles, marked the effort by Christian forces to regain control over the Iberian Peninsula. During the 11th and 12th centuries, 
the Christian kingdom gradually pushed southward, capturing major cities like Toledo, Valencia, and Seville. This slow but steady advance led to the eventual fall of the Taifa kingdoms one by one as they were absorbed into the Christian realms. One of the significant turning points in the history of Al-Andalus was the capture of Toledo in 1085 by King Alfonso VI of Castile. This event significantly altered the battle of power and demonstrated the resolute determination of the Christian forces. The capture of Toledo also had cultural implications as it brought Christians into direct contact with the advanced Islamic culture that had flourished in the region for centuries. Amidst this complex backdrop, a remarkable kingdom emerged in the southern part of Al-Andalus, the Nasrid Kingdom of Granada. The Nasrid dynasty managed to survive for several centuries due to a combination of diplomacy, alliances, and a relatively strong military. The Nasrid rulers established the standing Alhambra Palace complex, which stands as a testament to the architectural and artistic achievements of the Islamic Spain. However, by the late 15th century, the pressure on Granada intensified. The marriage of Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile, along with their military campaigns, paved the way for the final chapter in the history of Al-Andalus, the last Muslim stronghold. The Emirate of Granada fell in 1492 after a long siege, marking the end of Islamic rule in the Iberian Peninsula. The conquest of Granada led to significant changes, including the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from Spain during the Spanish Inquisition. This marked the end of the coexistence and cultural exchange that had characterized Al-Andalus for centuries. In conclusion, the history of Islamic conquest and Al-Andalus in Spain is a complex and multifaceted narrative that spans nearly eight centuries. It encompasses the rise and fall of empires, the exchange of ideas and cultures, and the clashes between different faiths and civilizations. Al-Andalus remains a testament to the potential for coexistence and the influence of diverse cultures in shaping the course of history. The Emirate of Granada's resilience as the last Islamic stronghold in Iberia is a tale of skillful diplomacy, fortuitous geography, and sheer determination. For centuries, while vast portions of the Iberian Peninsula were reconquered by Christian forces, Granada adeptly maintained its independence. This was largely facilitated by its geographical positioning. The rugged Sierra Nevada mountains created a natural fortress against potential invaders. Furthermore, the Emirate engaged in a form of real politique, often paying tributes to stronger northern Christian kingdoms, surely Castile. This move was not just about survival, but also about leveraging the rivalries among Christian kingdoms to its advantage. The ambition of the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, combined with the religious fervor of the Reconquista, set the stage for this decade-long conflict. Their vision of a united Christian Spain was incompatible with the presence of a Muslim kingdom. The war was characterized by extended sieges and swift guerrilla tactics, emblematic of the mountainous terrain of southern Spain. Christian forces employed a methodical approach targeting the peripheries of Granada, capturing pivotal towns, and gradually encircling the capital. Meanwhile, the defenders of Granada, led by various sultans over this period, leveraged their intimate knowledge of the terrain to conduct swift raids and ambushes, inflicting significant casualties and disrupting enemy logistics. War is as much a test of diplomatic acumen as it is of military prowess. Throughout the conflict, both sides often sought to negotiate, realizing the importance of diplomacy alongside direct confrontation. The Catholic monarchs, understanding the symbolic importance of Granada, aimed a peaceful integration of the territory into their realm. Muhammad XIII, commonly known as Boabdil, on the other hand, aimed to secure the best possible conditions for his people, fully aware of the military might facing him. These intermittent negotiations and truces were critical in shaping the course of war, highlighting that even in intense religious conflicts, pragmatism often found its place. The climactic siege of Granada was a testament to the determination of both sides. Christian forces, having made significant territorial gains over the decade, surrounded the city, enforcing a brutal brocade. Inside the city walls, conditions rapidly deteriorated. The inhabitants, once living in a flourishing center of Andalusian culture, faced severe food shortages and the specter of disease. Despite the desperate resistance and attempts to break the siege, the imbalance of resources and manpower became increasingly evident as the months wore on. Boabdil's eventual surrender in 1942 was not a mere act of submission. 
It was a calculated move to secure the best future for Granada's inhabitants. The Treaty of Granada, outlining the terms of surrender, was notably lenient. It guaranteed religious freedoms for Muslims, allowing them to live according to their customs and laws. This was a significant concession from the Catholic monarchs, who were keen on presenting the conquest as a benevolent integration rather than a hostile takeover. However, in the subsequent years, this promise was reneged upon. As pressures for conversion and assimilation grew, culminating in the eventual explosion of the Moriscos, Muslims who had converted to Christianity the early 17th century. This poignant moment encapsulates the emotional and cultural gravity of the Reconquista's conclusion. As Bob Dill looked back at the Alhambra and the city, the weight of centuries of Muslim rule and the impending exile culminated in a deep sigh of sorrow. The alleged remark from his mother, Aisha, underscores the societal expectations of a ruler, contrasting the raw, personal grief of losing one's homeland with the stoicism expected of a king. This legend, whether entirely factual or partly apocryphal, has left an indelible mark on the narrative of the Reconquista, illustrating the profound human emotions behind historical events. What were the consequences? There were religious, political, exploration, and architectural legacy consequences. So, religious, the Reconquista's culmination intensified, the push towards religious homogenization in Spain. Over the subsequent decades, policies grew increasingly stringent against Muslims, and later against Jews. This erosion of religious rights, often under the guise of unity and purity of faith, culminated in forced conversions and the eventual expulsion of those who retained their Islamic faith. Political consequences were, with Granada's incorporation, the Iberian Peninsula for the first time was almost entirely under Christian rule. This victory solidified the union between Castile and Aragon, transforming Spain into a formidable European power. The internal consolidation facilitated Spain's external imperial ambitions in the centuries to come. What were the exploratory consequences? 1492 was not just pivotal for the Iberian Peninsula, it had global ramifications. With the conquest complete, the Catholic monarchs turned their gaze westwards, sponsoring Columbus Voyage. His subsequent discovery of the Americas ushered in a new era of exploration, colonization, and the complex web of global interactions that would shape world history. What were the architectural legacy consequences? One of them, the Alhambra stands as a represent testament to the architectural and artistic brilliance of the Nasrid dynasty. Its intricate designs, water features, and architectural layout epitomize the zenith of the Andalusian art and culture. After the Reconquista, the palace complex was not raised or entirely repurposed, but was preserved and even expanded by Spanish rulers, serving as a residence for monarchs and a symbol of the intertwined history of Spain's Christians and Muslims past. The fall of Granada and the events surrounding it are emblematic of the broader currents of history, where political ambition, cultural expression, religious fervor, and personal emotions interweave to create a tapestry that defies epochs and shapes the trajectories of civilizations. In the annals of history, there emerged a time of unparalleled exploration and discovery, the illustrious age of exploration. At the forefront of this remarkable epoch stood the intrepid Spanish Empire, a force driven by insatiable ambition, ready to conquer the uncharted waters and expand their dominion across vast oceans. Close your eyes and be transported to the bustling harbors of Spanish ports, where sailors buzzed with excitement and apprehension as they prepared for audacious voyages into the unknown. One of these daring explorers was Christopher Columbus, a visionary dreamer with an insatiable thirst for discovery. In 1492, with the blessing of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, Columbus set sail, his heart brimming with hope and determination to chart a new route to the fabled Indies. Envision the grandeur and scale of Columbus' expedition as they embarked on their perilous journey a brave crew filled with a sense of adventure and curiosity sailed forth into the vast expanse of the Atlantic, much like modern-day astronauts launching into the cosmos. Doubts and fears rose and fell like the undulating waves that rocked the ship. 
Just as the crew began to question their sanity of their mission, a thrilling cry broke through the salty air, Land Ahoy! Yet instead of the silken shores of the Indies, they had stumbled upon a land as vast and enchanting as a fairy tale, the Americas. The news of Columbus' serendipitous discovery spread like wildfire, igniting the hearts of other adventurous souls eager to carve their own place in history. Among them was Ferdinand Magellan, a daring Portuguese explorer sailing under the Spanish banner. In 1519, Magellan embarked on an audacious quest to find a westward passage to the Spice Islands. The sheer magnitude of the undertaking seemed insurmountable, but Magellan's resolve was unwavering. As you journey alongside Magellan and his intrepid crew, picture the perils they faced as they navigated through the treacherous waters and uncharted straits. The world seemed to shrink beneath their feet as they ventured into the unknown, braving storms, battling mutinies, and even encountering cannibalistic tribes along the way. Despite their captain's tragic demise, Magellan's courageous crew pressed forward, defying all odds to achieve what was once deemed impossible, circumnavigating the globe. The Spanish Empire's newfound world, pouring in from bountiful lands of the Americas, transformed them into an enviable powerhouse. Their territorial dominion stretched across continents, from the Aztec marvels of Mexico to the Incan treasures of Peru. The allure of legendary cities of gold like El Dorado tantalized adventurers, driving them deep into unexplored jungles where danger and enchantment entwined. Yet this extraordinary tale of exploration and conquest was not without its complexities. The convergence of European explorers and indigenous civilizations sparked encounters of epic proportions. Languages, foods, beliefs and traditions mingled and clashed, shaping entirely new societies on both sides of the Atlantic. As you delve deeper into this enthralling story, witness the challenges and adversities that the Spanish Empire faced as they expanded their grasp. Amidst grand conquests and golden ambitions, the shadows of suffering and injustice loomed large. Indigenous populations faced exploitation and enslavement, and the introduction of foreign diseases wreaked havoc on their lives. But through all the triumphs and tribulations, the Spanish explorers left an indelible mark on the world. Their language, religion, and customs mingled with those of the lands they colonized, shaping new societies and cultures that endure to this day. The age of exploration and the rise of the Spanish Empire were chapters of history that read like epic adventure novels. It was a saga of bravery, curiosity, and the unyielding spirit of humanity, eager to uncover the secrets of a world that was once a vast expanse of uncharted dreams. As you journeyed through this captivating chronicle, you witnessed how daring dreams and astonishing realities danced hand in hand across the oceans of time. The tales of these fearless explorers continue to inspire seekers and dreamers urging them to embark on their own voyage of discovery, wherever they may lead. The legacy of the Age of Exploration serves as a reminder of the boundless potential that lies within the human spirit, a force that can push the boundaries of the known world and propel us toward new horizons of understanding and wonder. So, open your eyes and hearts to the echoes of this historic era, where the dreams of yesterday continue to inspire the dreams of tomorrow. We will be unraveling the complex, awe-inspiring and sometimes cautionary tale of Habsburg Spain. From the grand conquest of the new world to the unparalleled cultural achievements in arts and architecture, we are going to explore an era that has left an indelible mark on human history. The union of the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon in 1479 under the Catholic monarchs Isabella I of Castile and Ferdinand II of Aragon was a pivotal moment in the history of Spain and Europe. This union effectively consolidated the Iberian Peninsula, creating a unified and powerful Spain that successfully completed the Reconquista, an almost eight-century-long campaign to reclaim territories held by Muslims. This climactic event culminated in the capture of Granada in 1492, marking the end of Muslim rule in Iberia and ushering in a new era of Spanish might and religious unity. In the same year, 1492, Christopher Columbus, sponsored by Isabella and Ferdinand, embarked on a voyage that resulted in the discovery of the Americas. This monumental event initiated the Age of Discovery, 
opening new realms for Spanish exploration, colonization and exploitation, with the new lands to conquer and resources to extract. Particularly in the Americas, Spain quickly emerged as one of the world's most formidable empires. This laid the groundwork for the Habsburg dynasty to inherit and expand upon this newfound global influence. The Habsburg dynasty's ascent in Spain began with Charles I, also known as Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor who ascended the Castilla and Aragon thrones in 1516. Charles V was not only the king of United Spain but also inherited the Habsburg territories in Austria, the Low Countries, which is now Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, and the Holy Roman Emperor title. His reign marked the beginning of Spain's global empire as he sought to consolidate his diverse holdings under centralized Habsburg rule. His son, Philip II, who reigned from 1556 to 1598, further solidified Spain's status as a European and global powerhouse. Under Philip II, Spain reached its political and military peak, defeating the Ottoman Empire at the Battle of Lepanto in 1571 and attempting to invade England with the ill-fated Spanish Armada in 1588. Habsburg Spain was a composite monarchy, a governance form in which a single monarch rules multiple states or territories that retain their own laws, traditions and institutions. This concept was crucial for controlling regions with their own historical identities. The various Habsburg territories like Castille, Aragon, the Low Countries and others were not unified into a single homogenized state but were governed by a complex system of wise royalties, councils and local nobility all ultimately answering to the Habsburg monarch. The Habsburg dynasty's reach under Charles I and Philip II was global, encompassing not just the Iberian Peninsula, but also territories like the Netherlands and parts of Italy, including the Kingdom of Naples and the Duché of Milan. Overseas, the Habsburgs controlled vast colonies in the Americas, from present-day California and the southwestern United States down through Central America and into South America, as well as the Philippines in Asia. The sun famously never set on the Habsburg Empire, reflecting its vast territorial expanse, cultural variety and richness and the challenges under its dominion. The Habsburg dynasty oversaw an unprecedented imperial expansion that profoundly altered world history. Pivotal aspect of this expansion was the America's conquest, Hernán Cortés, that the Spanish expedition that resulted in the Aztec Empire's fall between 1519 and 1521. By combining military technology, indigenous alliances and disease to weaken the Aztecs, Cortés and his men captured Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital. Similarly, Francisco Pizarro led the conquest of the Inca Empire, spanning from 1532 until 1572. The capture of the last Inca stronghold at Vilcabamba. These conquests resulted in a massive territorial gain and brought vast wealth to Spain in gold and silver, although they also led to the near eradication of indigenous civilizations and cultures. In Asia, the Philippines became the primary focus of Spanish expansion. Named after King Philip II, Ferdinand Magellan claimed the archipelago for Spain in 1521. Although it took several more decades to establish effective Spanish control, the Philippines became a crucial part of the Spanish trading empire, acting as a hub between Spanish America and Asia, particularly for the Manila Galeon trade route that connected Manila to Acapulco in Mexico. This enabled Spain to participate in lucrative trade with China and other Asian kingdoms, importing goods like silk, spices and porcelain to the Americas and Europe. Relations with other European powers during the Habsburg era were often complicated and antagonistic. The most famous episode is likely the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, an attempt by Philip II to invade England and depose the Protestant Queen Elizabeth I. This venture ended in disaster, weakening Spain's naval supremacy and shifting the European power balance. France under the Valois and the later Bourbon dynasties was another frequent rival, as seen in the Habsburg Valois Wars, who fought over Italy's control and European supremacy. The Habsburgs also had complex relations with the Holy Roman Empire, primarily consisting of German-speaking states. While the Spanish and Austrian branches of the Habsburg were technically separate, they often collaborated, especially in conflicts like the Thirty Years' War, to maintain Catholic influence and Habsburg power in Central Europe. The Habsburg rule period 
particularly the 16th and 17th centuries, coincides with the Spanish Golden Age, a time of extraordinary cultural, artistic, and intellectual activity. In literature, Miguel de Cervantes, Don Quixote, published in two parts in 1605 and 1615, stands out as a seminal work. This novel is considered one of the greatest works of fiction ever written and is emblematic of the picaresque literary tradition in Spain. It explores themes of chivalry, reality versus illusion, and the human condition, all with a keen sense of humor and deep insight into human nature. Spanish drama also saw groundbreaking contributions, primarily from playwrights like Lope de Vega and Calderón de la Barça. Their works, often staged in the Corrales or open-air theaters, explored a wide range of themes from love and honor to social justice and religious faith. In the arts, the period produced masters like El Greco, a Greek-born painter who made his career in Spain. Known for his elongated figures and dreamlike hues of color and light, El Greco's works are often categorized as mannerist and are considered some of the most original and evocative of the period. Diego Velázquez emerged as another towering figure in Spanish art, celebrated for works like Las Meninas, a complex and mysterious painting that has fascinated art historians and critics for centuries. Velázquez's work stands out for its technical mastery and its exploration of human psychology. Baroque architecture also flourished during this period, with landmarks like the El Escorial Monastery and Palace near Madrid serving as symbols of both spiritual and temporal power. Designed under the orders of Philip II, El Escorial functioned as a royal palace, a library, and a burial place for Spanish kings. Besides being a religious center, its austere, grandiose architecture reflects the ideological rigidity and imperial aspirations of Spain at the height of its power. However, the tremendous wealth and power amassed by Habsburg Spain were not without their drawbacks. The influx of gold and silver for the Americas led to rampant inflation, and the empire was often mired in expensive wars that drained its coffers. Socially, the period saw the expulsion of Jews and Muslims, which not only eroded the fabric of Spain's historically diverse society, but also led to a loss of valuable human capital. A complex system of mercantilist laws aimed at keeping wealth within the empire often had the opposite effect, stifling entrepreneurship and leaving the economy brittle. Additionally, the enormous territories Spain governed were diverse and challenging to manage, resulting in frequent revolts and uprisings, like the Dutch Revolt in the Low Countries, which eventually led to the independence of the Dutch Republic. By the 17th century, Habsburg Spain began to show signs of decline. The rule of the later Habsburgs, such as Philip III and Philip IV, was marred by political corruption, economic instability, and military defeats. A devastating blow came with the signing of the Treaty of the Pyrenees in 1659, which saw Spain ceding several territories to France. This decline continued into the 18th century, culminating in the War of the Spanish Succession which ended the Spanish Habsburg line and initiated the rule of the Bourbon dynasty. The legacy of Habsburg Spain is vast and complex, encompassing extraordinary cultural achievements and a worldwide empire, but also a legacy of colonial exploitation and social upheaval. It left an indelible mark on the world map, influencing cultures and societies from the Americas to Asia. The laws, institutions, and the languages it spread continue to shape many nations today. And yet. It also serves as a cautionary tale of how imperial overreach, economic mismanagement, and social intolerance can lead to decline. In summary, the era of Habsburg Spain was one of the grand contradictions, a time of immense power and influence matched by equally monumental challenges and failures. It was a period that forever changed the course of history, laying the foundation for the modern world while also providing lessons on the complexities and pitfalls of empire. Wow. What a journey through the highs and lows of Habsburg Spain. We've seen how it was a time of fundamental influence and power, but also a period riddled with economic, social, and political pitfalls. Whether it was the artistic brilliance of El Greco and Velázquez of the complexities of handling an empire stretched across continents, Habsburg Spain is a study in contrast, full of lessons that resonate to this day. The War of Spanish Succession A royal debt, conflicting wills, alliances, treaties, and a battle over the Spanish throne 
that engulfed much of Europe. This war had it all. But to fully grasp its magnitude, we need to delve into the complex backdrop that set the stage for this continental crisis. Spain in the 17th century was in an almost perpetual state of conflict, which significantly contributed to its decline. The 30 years of war was a brutal and expensive engagement for Spain. The war resulted in not only military defeat, but also in financial ruin, exacerbating existing issues like a declining population and an over-reliance on imported goods. The cost of maintaining the Rico, the famed but high-maintenance Spanish infantry, along with other military expenses, drained the Spanish coffers. Additionally, Spain's colonial ambitions and the resultant conflicts in the New World further stretched the country's military and economic resources. The Franco-Spanish War between 1635 and 1659 saw Spain go head-to-head -head with the rising power of France. It was yet another costly endeavor that weakened Spain further. The Treaty of the Pyrenees in 1659 was humiliating for Spain. The kingdom ceded several territories to France, including parts of the Spanish Netherlands, today's Belgium, and Catalonia. Spain's military prestige was tarnished, and it became increasingly evident that its era of continental dominance had come to an end. Internal strife was also on the rise. Economic pressures led to uprisings, notably the Catalan Revolt between 1640 and 1652, and the Portuguese Restoration War between 1640 and 1668. The loss of Portugal in particular was a significant blow as it took with it a lucrative colonial empire. Essentially, military expenditure, loss of territories, and internal unrest coalesced to pave the way for Spain's decline. Spain's monarchy wasn't fearing any better. The Habsburg family had long suffered from the effects of inbreeding, which was seen as a way to preserve the purity of the royal line. The culmination of this was Charles II, who had significant physical and mental disabilities. Not only was he impotent, but his poor health also meant that he was often unable to rule effectively, further contributing to Spain's decline. The lack of a direct heir from Charles II created a vacuum that became the focal point of European politics. Different factions within the Spanish court pushed various candidates as potential heirs, leading to internal conflicts. Advisors to Charles II were divided between those favoring a French Bourbon successor and those pushing for an Austrian Habsburg to maintain the dynasty. The absence of a secure line of succession for an empire as vast as Spain's was a ticking time bomb. Various European powers started to circle, each wanting to exert their influence over the Spanish throne. The French were particularly proactive giving their family ties to the Spanish Habsburg through the marriage of Louis XIV and Maria Theresa, Charles II's half-sister. As a result, the latter years of Charles II's reign were dominated by diplomatic maneuvering, secret alliances, and political intrigue. Charles II was aware of the geopolitical ramifications of his death and spent considerable time contemplating his will. The list of potential heirs was relatively short, but packed with political implications. The leading candidates were from the French Bourbon and Austrian Habsburg families. A third, albeit less likely option, was Joseph Ferdinand, a Wittelsbach prince from Bavaria, favored by some as a neutral candidate. After years of contemplation and counsel from his advisors, Charles II chose Philip of Anjou, the grandson of Louis XIV and his heir. The choice was partly influenced by the belief that France was the most stable and powerful nation, hence the most capable of protecting Spain's vast territories. Charles II put forth explicit conditions. France and Spain would remain separate to prevent the unification of the two crowns. The immediate aftermath of Charles II's death and the opening of his will led to a flurry of diplomatic activities. France was overjoyed but tried it carefully knowing that a Bourbon-controlled Spain could potentially ignite a continent-wide conflict. Austria felt snubbed and betrayed, as the will was seen as an affront to Habsburg prestige. England and the Dutch Republic had mixed feelings. Both nations were wary of a powerful France but were also hesitant 
to become embroiled in another costly European war. Europe's reaction to the will of Charles II was to strengthen their respective alliances. England, Australia and the Dutch Republic came together in the Grand Alliance, aimed primarily at curbing the expansion of urban power in Europe. The alliance was formalized with the signing of several treaties, such as the Treaty of The Hague in 1701, which sought to distribute Spanish possessions to prevent French hegemony. Philip V's ascension to the Spanish throne in November 1700 made the situation untenable for the Grand Alliance. Despite initial attempts at a peaceful resolution, diplomatic talks broke down. For instance, the Partition Treaties of 1698 and 1700 aimed to divide the Spanish possessions among European powers, but failed to gain traction. The Grand Alliance found itself unable to accept a Bourbon king ruling Spain, given the implications for the European balance of power. Minor skirmishes soon escalated into open conflict. With failed diplomatic efforts and increasing military mobilization, the stage was set for the War of Spanish Succession. What had started as a royal succession crisis was now a continental flashpoint, pulling in multiple European powers into a conflict that would reshape Europe's political landscape for years to come. A war of Spanish succession and its aftermath have left an indelible mark on the pages of European history. As we've seen, the conflict wasn't just about who would sit on the Spanish throne. It was also a multifaceted power struggle that shaped the destinies of several European nations for generations to come. We're diving into the captivating yet tragic life of Charles II of Spain, the last Habsburg King of Spain, whose reign marked a significant turning point not only for Spain but for Europe as a whole. From his childless state and deteriorating health to the advisors who influenced him, and the geopolitical ramifications that followed his death. Charles II of Spain, often referred to as El Hechizado or the Bewitched, was a figure emblematic of decline, not just for his personal ailments but for the Spanish Empire as well. Born in 1661, Charles II was the last of the Habsburg rulers, a dynasty that had dominated Spain for nearly two centuries. His reign from 1665 to 1700 was marked by a series of unfortunate events debilitating health issues, a failure to produce an heir, and complex geopolitical maneuvering by European powers seeking to gain an upper hand in the anticipated Spanish succession. This video aims to explore these pivotal aspects that had contributed to Charles II's troubled reign and set the stage for the War of Spanish Succession. The Habsburg family was notorious for inbreeding, a strategy meant to keep power within the family, but one that led to a significant health problem. Charles II was no exception. Born from parents who were uncle and niece, his genetic makeup was compromised from the outset. The king suffered from the Habsburg jaw, a deformity that made it difficult for him to chew and speak. He also faced numerous other health issues, including epilepsy, severe digestive problems, and frequent infections. The deteriorating health of the monarch had a profound effect on governance. Charles II was often unable to attend state matters, leaving the responsibility to his advisors and queen regent. Moreover, his poor health was taken by many as a sign of divine displeasure, contributing to a sense of decline and melancholy that pervaded the Spanish court and filtered down to the public. By the end of his life, Charles II's physical and mental limitations had left him almost entirely incapable of ruling, creating a power vacuum and leading to a burgeoning crisis of succession. The story of Charles II's health is not just one of personal tragedy, but also an encapsulation of the decaying state of the Spanish monarchy. Spain, which had once been a powerhouse of the European continent, was by now a reigning force, beset by financial difficulties, military defeats, and internal strife. Charles II's ill health can be viewed as both a symptom and a symbol of this broader decline. Charles II was married twice, first to Mary Louise of Orleans, and later to Mariana of Newburgh. Both marriages were contracted with political aims in mind. Mary Louise was intended to bring France closer as an ally, while Mariana was seen as strengthening ties with Austria. Despite these political intentions, neither marriage produced the desperately needed heir to continue the Habsburg line of Spain. The failure to produce an heir had dire consequences for both Charles and Spain. Not only did it lead to questions about Charles' virility, and capability but it also catalyzed political maneuvering among the European powers. 
the Spanish crown was not just a national symbol. It represented control over extensive colonies in the Americas, as well as crucial territories in Europe, like the Spanish Netherlands and Southern Italy. A vacant throne, therefore had enormous geopolitical implications. The lack of a direct successor led to increasing tension both within Spain and across Europe. Within the Spanish court, factions began to form, advocating for various European princes to be named as their heir. The absence of a clear heir also increased the burdens on advisors and led to rampant speculation among European powers. This uncertainty destabilized the Spanish government, as various factions engaged in politicking to install their preferred candidate. The anticipated demise of Charles II without an heir created a political maelstrom in the 17th century Europe. Spain's extensive empire was too significant a prize to be ignored, and powers like France, Austria and even England were maneuvering to put their candidates on the Spanish throne. The French Bourbons, through Louis XIV, sought to extend their sphere of influence by attempting to put one of their own in line for the Spanish crown. Austria, keen on maintaining healthcare control over Spain, was equally proactive. Various treaties and agreements were floated in an attempt to preemptively divide vast Spanish empire and maintain a balance of power. For example, the partition treaties between France and England aimed to dispute Spanish territories in a manner acceptable to both. However, these efforts failed to reach any meaningful consensus, given that the Spanish were understandably averse to their empire being divided by foreign powers. As Charles II's health continued to deteriorate, the geopolitical joking intensified. The European powers understood that the Spanish question was not just about who would sit on the throne in Madrid, it was about the balance of power in Europe, just control of important trade routes and the ideological battle between Catholicism and Protestantism. As such, alliances were made and broken, treaties were signed and then ignored, and espionage and diplomatic intrigue became the order of the day. During his reign, Charles II had his circle of advisors who exerted considerable influence, given his physical and mental limitations. These advisors were sharply divided over the issue of succession. Some were loyal to the Habsburg family and advocated for an Austrian successor, while others were more Francophile and pushed for a Bourbon king. Yet others were pragmatic, looking for the candidate most likely to restore Spain's former glory. Factions within the court were not just ideological, they were also rooted in deeply personal loyalties and animosities. The Queen Regent, during Charles' minority, and later his two wives, had their preferences and biases, further muddying the waters. Advisors, nobles, and clergymen were often divided not just by their preferred candidates, but also by competing visions of what Spain could be, whether it should maintain its traditional Catholic orthodoxy or modernize and adapt to changing times. As Charles II neared the end of his life, his advisors took on increasingly critical roles. The influence of priests and confidants, who had the king's ear in his feral state, grew substantially. Various potential heirs were discussed, and intense debates ensued in the Spanish court. The advisors were well aware that they were not just deciding the fate of Spain, but potentially the balance of power in Europe. Aware of the geopolitical earthquake his death would cause, Charles II spent a considerable amount of time contemplating his will. His final choice was Philip of Anjou, a grandson of Louis XIV of France from the Berber family. This decision was influenced by the belief that a strong and stable France could better protect the territorial integrity of Spain's empire. However, Charles II included a critical caveat in his will. France and Spain would remain separate entities to prevent a Franco-Spanish superstate. The opening of Charles II's sealed will ignited immediate and intense diplomatic activity across Europe. France was understandably jubilant but treaded cautiously, aware that overt enthusiasm could trigger a continent-wide war. Austria felt snubbed. Considering this move as a betrayal of Habsburg legacy, England and other European powers were caught in the middle, not wanting to antagonize France but also wary of its rising power. England and other European powers were placed in a precarious position. They recognized the risks of a powerful Bourbon-controlled Spain, but were also loath to become embroiled in a potentially devastating war. Public opinion was divided, and political leaders faced the challenge of balancing their national interests with those of their respective alliances. The immediate effect of Charles II's will was a flurry of diplomatic negotiations and renegotiations. Countries revisited their alliances and treaties, seeking to either fortify or break them based on the new reality. 
it was clear that the peaceful transition of power in Spain was highly unlikely, given the competing interests and long-standing rivalries among European nations. This intense diplomatic activity eventually led to the formation of new alliances, the Grand Alliance, comprised of England, Austria and the Dutch Republic, was one such coalition that formed with the objective of countering Bourbon expansionism. The ink had barely dried on these new agreements when it became apparent that diplomatic solutions had run their course. The various parties had drawn their lines in the sand and the stage was set for the War of Spanish Succession. The opening salvos of the war were met with mixed feelings in Spain. While some saw it as a necessary evil to protect Spanish sovereignty, others viewed it as a disastrous conflict that would drain the already depleted Spanish resources. What was clear, however, was that the choices made during the reign of Charles II had set in motion a chain of events that would reshape Europe for decades to come. Charles II of Spain remains an enigmatic and tragic figure. His reign was marked by ill health, the inability to produce a heir, and the increasing encroachment of foreign powers eager to take advantage of Spain's weakening position. His advisors, though influential, were sharply divided and unable to provide a coherent path forward. Ultimately, Charles II's choices, especially his will, acted as the catalyst for the War of Spanish Succession, a conflict that would redraw the political map of Europe. His legacy, therefore, is one of decline and disorder, but it is also a cautionary tale. It serves as a reminder of the complexities of succession in monarchical systems and the geopolitical upheavals that can result from the death of a single ruler. The story of Charles II is not merely that of a man, but of an empire at the crossroads, teetering on the brink of a collapse, yet shaping the future of a continent in its final moments. And there you have it folks, the complex and multifaceted story of Charles II of Spain. A monarch who became the fulcrum upon which the scales of European power were delicately balanced. His reign saw Spain grappling with decline, internal unrest, and a host of other challenges. However, the choices made during his rule had far-reaching implications, setting the stage for the War of Spanish Succession and reshaping the political landscape of Europe for years to come. Charles II was the last Habsburg monarch of Spain and his childless and ailing condition led to an enormous power vacuum that nearly turned Europe upside down. The will and testament of Charles II, the last Habsburg monarch of Spain, is a landmark document that reverberated far beyond the Spanish court, igniting a series of diplomatic and military events that had long-lasting implications for Europe. It marked a critical juncture in the complex labyrinth of the 17th century European politics and alliances. Weighed down by the absence of an heir and failing health, Charles II had to make a choice that was not just a matter of domestic governance, but a pivotal moment affecting the stability of Europe for years to come. Charles II was aware that his frailty and childlessness posed a significant risk to the continuity of the Spanish crown. Internally, various factions at the Spanish court lobbied incessantly, each with its favorite candidate for succession. This cacophony of voices was not merely a domestic issue, it was intrinsically tied to Spain's place in the broader European context. The neighboring powers, primarily France and Austria, sought to sway Charles' decision as his chosen heir would significantly tilt the balance of power in their favor or against them. Consequently, ambassadors, spies, and envoys engaged in covert and overt diplomatic emissions aimed at influencing the royal testament. Charles himself was torn between loyalties, political expediencies, and the weight of the Habsburg legacy. Several names were floated as possible successors, reflecting a myriad of political alliances and potential power shifts in Europe. Archduke Charles of Austria was a prominent contender, a candidate that would maintain Habsburg continuity. However, this would risk merging the Austrian and Spanish crowns, something that alarmed England and the Dutch Republic. The other main candidate was Philip, Duke of Anjou, a Bourbon, and a grandson to Louis XIV of France. Support for Philip was rooted in France's ascending status as a military and economic powerhouse, which could potentially rejuvenate Spain's dividing fortunes. This list was not exhaustive, though, with other European nobility being considered, even if briefly, as possible heirs. Advisors such as Cardinal Portocarlo and influential figures like the Queen Mariana of Austria played crucial roles as conduits for the views and pressures coming from abroad. After years of uncertainty and diplomatic maneuvering, Charles II made his final decision. Bequeathing his throne to Philip, Duke of Anjou, this choice shook the very foundations of European politics. France felt cautiously triumphant, 
but understood the precarious nature of the situation. The potential for a united Bourbon diocese across France and Spain was a threatening prospect for the rest of Europe. Austria, on the other hand, felt outright betrayed and maligned, interpreting the will as a violation of Habsburg legacy and a disruption to their European ambitions. The Spanish court itself had varying reactions. While some felt relieved that a decision was finally made, others were concerned about the political implications of a Bourbon king, not least because it shifted the Spanish alliances and incurred the risk of being subjugated to the French influence. Why did Charles II choose a Bourbon hire? One of the most compelling reasons was the ascent of France as the dominant European power. A Franco-Spanish alliance, Charles II believed would safeguard the territorial integrity of the Spanish Empire, which had been dwindling due to military and financial constraints. Additionally, Charles had been advised that the Bourbons, particularly under Louis XIV, had successfully centralized power, something that Spain badly needed to address its political fragmentations. He also foresaw that a Bourbon succession would be more diplomatically tenable and less likely to incite immediate conflict compared to an Austrian Habsburg succession, given the multiple territorial disputes between Austrian and Spanish interests. Charles II was astute enough to understand the risks of a Bourbon succession. To mitigate these, he included specific clauses in his will that aimed to prevent the unification of the French and Spanish kingdoms. This was an attempt to mollify other European powers who feared a Franco-Spanish superstate. These conditions had significant diplomatic repercussions, becoming a cornerstone in the Treaty of Utrecht that eventually ended the War of Spanish Succession. Whether they succeeded in their intended goal remains a subject of historical interpretation, but they undoubtedly influenced the diplomatic course of the era. The will of Charles II was more than a testament. It was a diplomatic bombshell that set off a complex chain reaction leading to the War of Spanish Succession. It showcased the intricate political machinations that were at play within and beyond the Spanish court, as European powers veered for influence and territorial gains. Charles II's choice of a Bourbon hire was a gamble, both an admission of Spain's declining fortunes and a calculated risk to secure its future. However, the gamble did not pay off as he had hoped, plunging Europe into a protracted conflict. Thus, the will remains a defining document, laying bare the complexities of inheritance, alliances and enmities that shaped Europe at the dawn of the 18th century. The balance of power concerns that led to the War of Spanish Succession. As the Spanish crown teetered on the edge of a royal vacuum, all of Europe held its breath, carefully gauging how the distribution of Spanish assets would affect the fragile equilibrium between the continent's major powers. The demise of Charles II of Spain in the closing months of the 17th century ignited a powder keg of geopolitical tensions that had been simmering in the European landscape. At the center of this complex web of alliances and hostilities lay the philosophical doctrine of the balance of power, developed over centuries and refined through countless diplomatic and military interactions. This doctrine aimed to ensure that no single European power could rise to a position of overwhelming dominance. The bequeathing of the Spanish throne to Philip of Anjou, a Bourbon at the grandson of Louis XIV of France, set alarm bells ringing across European capitals. The balance of power was not just a theoretical concept, but an operative principle that had informed European geopolitics for several centuries. Its roots can be traced back to the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 which ended the Thirty Years' War and established a tenuous equilibrium among the principal European states. This balance was safeguarded through an intricate network of treaties, diplomatic marriages, and sometimes military interventions. However, by the late 17th century, several factors such as the rise of France as a dominant military power and the decline of Spain had already put this balance under strain. This will of Charles II acted as a catalyst pushing the fragile system to its breaking point. Nations around Europe therefore found themselves compelled to re-evaluate these strategies and alliances to prevent a Bourbon-dominated monolithic power from emerging. The potential union of the French and Spanish crowns under the Bourbon family was something that sent shockwaves through the courts of Europe. If realized, such a union would create an entity that commanded formidable military prowess thanks to France's seasoned army and advanced navy and unprecedented economic resources due to Spain's extensive overseas colonies. The combined territories would stretch from the Americas in the west to the Philippines in the east, and from the low countries of Europe down to the boot of Italy. 
the strategic implications were staggering. A Franco-Spanish alliance under a single crown would not only possess a monumental pool of manpower and resources, but would also control vital trading routes and choke points, something that would jeopardize the commercial interests of maritime nations like England and the Dutch Republic. These were not idle fears, they were palpable risks that prompted hurried diplomatic and military preparations. Spain's territorial possessions were a linchpin in the global balance of power, holding territories in Italy such as Naples and Sicily meant controlling vital Mediterranean trading routes, something of great interest to the Holy Roman Empire and its Austrian Habsburgs. Additionally, the Spanish Netherlands was a wealthy and strategically located region whose control could severely disadvantage England and the Netherlands in terms of European trade. Even beyond Europe, Spain's colonies in the Americas were legendary for their wealth. These colonies were sources of precious metals and valuable commodities like sugar and tobacco. The prospect of these vast territories falling under a single Bourbon dominion led to heightened tensions and a flurry of diplomatic activity aimed at preventing such an outcome. Before the cannons roared and soldiers marched, there was a concerted effort to solve the succession crisis through diplomatic means. Treaties like the First and Second Partition Treaties were earnest attempts to distribute Spanish territories in such a way as to maintain European stability. However, these treaties were doomed by a web of conflicting national interests and deep-rooted mistrust among European powers. For instance, Austria was not willing to make concessions that would see Italy falling under French influence. While England and the Dutch Republic were preoccupied with checking French naval and commercial power, in the end, collective inability to come to a diplomatic agreement signaled the exhaustion of peaceful options and set the stage for the inevitable conflict, the War of Spanish Succession. In retrospect, the complexities surrounding the balance of power in early 18th century Europe were exacerbated by the Spanish succession crisis to an extent that war became almost unavoidable. Doctrine which had served for centuries as a stabilizing force faced its most severe test as the prospect of a united Bourbon dynasty controlling an expansive global empire loomed large. Failed diplomatic initiatives and a tense atmosphere full of distrust and competitive interests ultimately led the European powers down the path of military confrontation. The War of Spanish Succession thus can be seen as both a failure and a reassertion of the balance of power principle, influencing European and global politics for decades thereafter. And there you have it, the intricate dynamics and failed diplomatic efforts that preceded the War of Spanish Succession. The complex weave of alliances, vested interests, and philosophical doctrines like the balance of power shaped the course of European history, setting the stage for the geopolitical landscape we recognize today. The Bourbon dynasty is a branch of the Capitan dynasty, which originated in France in the 10th century. The Bourbons ruled France from 1589 to 1792 and from 1814 to 1830, and also had branches in other countries such as Spain, Naples, Sicily, Parma, and Luxembourg. The current king of Spain, Philip VI, is a member of the Bourbon family. But how did the Bourbons come to power in Spain? Well, it all started with the death of Charles II, the last Habsburg king of Spain in 1700. Charles II had no children or siblings to inherit his throne, so he had to choose between two rival candidates, the Pope Angel the grandson of Louis XIV of France and Archduke Charles of Austria, the son of Leopold I, the Holy Roman Emperor. Charles II decided to name Philip of Anjou as his heir in his will, hoping that he would respect the integrity and autonomy of Spain. However, Philip's accession was not accepted by many European powers, especially Austria and England, who feared that France would dominate Spain and its colonies. They formed a coalition against Philip and supported Archduke Charles as their rival claimant. This sparked the War of the Spanish Succession, which lasted from 1701 to 1714. The war was fought on several fronts. In Spain, where Philip faced resistance from several regions that supported Charles, in Europe, where France fought against Austria, England, Holland, and other allies, and in America and Asia, where Spain's colonial possessions were attacked by British and Dutch forces. The war was a long and costly struggle that involved many battles and sieges. Some of the most notable ones were the Battle of Blenheim in 1704, where the Duke of Marlborough and Prince Eugene defeated the French and Bavarian armies in Germany. 
This was a decisive victory that prevented France from invading Austria and secured England's control over the Low Countries, the Battle of Remedies in 1706, where Marlborough again defeated the French in Belgium. This was another major victory that forced France to abandon its fortresses in Flanders and Brabant. The Battle of Almansa in 1707, where Philip's army defeated the Allied forces in Spain. This was a crucial victory that secured Philip's authority over most of Spain and allowed him to expel many supporters of Charles. The Battle of Galplaquet in 1709, where Marlborough and Eugene inflicted heavy casualties on the French in France. This was a bloody battle that weakened both sides but failed to break France's resistance. The Siege of Barcelona between 1713 and 1714, where Philip's army captured the last stronghold of Charles' supporters in Spain. This was a long and fierce siege that ended with the surrender of Barcelona and the abolition of Catalonia's autonomy. The war ended with the Treaty of Utrecht between 1713 and 14, which confirmed Philip as King of Spain, but also ceded many territories to other countries. For example, Austria saved the Spanish Netherlands, Naples, Milan, and Sardinia. These were valuable lands that increased Austria's power and prestige in Europe. England received Gibraltar and Menorca. These were strategic ports that gave England access to the Mediterranean Sea and its train routes. France received Sicily. This was a fertile island that enriched France's economy and culture. And Savoy was technically subsumed into the Kingdom of Sicily. The treaty also stipulated that Spain and France could not be united under one monarch. This was a way to prevent a possible Franco-Spanish alliance that could threaten Europe's balance of power. The War of the Spanish Succession marked the end of the Habsburg era in Spain and the beginning of the Bourbon era. It also marked the decline of Spain as a major European power and the rise of other countries such as France, England and Austria. However, it did not mean that Spain lost its importance or identity. Spain still retained a vast empire in America and Asia, which provided it with wealth and resources. Spain also maintained its culture and traditions, which influenced many other regions and peoples around the world. The Peninsular War, which took place between 1808 and 1814. This was a war that pitted Spain, Portugal and Britain against the invading French Empire of Napoleon Bonaparte. It was also a war that sparked a national uprising in Spain against the French occupation, known as the Spanish War of Independence. Let's begin. The Peninsular War was part of the larger Napoleonic Wars, which was a series of conflicts that involved most of Europe and other regions of the world between 1803 and 1815. The Napoleonic Wars were caused by Napoleon's ambition to create a French-dominated empire that would rival the British Empire. Napoleon also wanted to enforce his continental system which was a blockade that aimed to isolate Britain from European trade and weaken its economy. One of Napoleon's targets was Portugal, which was a close ally of Britain and refused to join the continental system. In 1807, Napoleon decided to invade Portugal with the help of Spain, which was his ally at the time. However, Napoleon had ulterior motives and also wanted to take over Spain and use it as a base for his operation in the Mediterranean and Africa. To achieve this, Napoleon tricked the Spanish royal family, Charles IV and his son Ferdinand VII, into meeting him in Bayonne, France, where he forced them to abdicate and installed his brother Joseph Bonaparte as the new king of Spain. He also issued a new constitution for Spain, known as the Bayonne Constitution, which abolished the privileges of the nobility and the clergy and centralized the power in Joseph's hands. However, most Spaniards rejected Napoleon's intervention and Joseph's rule. They rose up in revolt against the French troops that occupied the country. The revolt began on May 2, 1808 in Madrid, where a crowd attacked a French detachment that was escorting a members of the royal family to France. The French responded with brutal repression, killing hundreds of civilians. This event became known as the Dos de Mayo Uprising, and it inspired other cities and regions in Spain to join the rebellion. The Spanish rebels formed local juntas, councils, they claimed to represent the legitimate authority in the absence of the king. They also formed militias, guerrillas, that waged a guerrilla war against the French army. They used ambushes, raids, sabotage and hit-and-run tactics to harass and weaken the enemy. They also received support from the British army, which landed in Portugal in 1808 under Sir Arthur Willisley, later the Duke of Wellington, and from the Portuguese army, which fought alongside them. 
the Peninsular War was a long and bloody struggle that involved many battles and sieges. Some of the most famous ones were the Battle of Bailen in 1808, where a Spanish army under General Francisco Castaños defeated a French army under General Pierre Dupont, Del Tonk. This was the first major defeat of a Napoleonic army in Europe, and it boosted the morale of the Spanish resistance. The Battle of Corona in 1809, where a British army under Sir John Moore managed to evacuate by sea to being pursued by the French army under Marshal Nicolas Soult. Moore was killed during the battle, but his sacrifice allowed most of his troops to escape. The Battle of Talavera in 1809, where a British Spanish army under Wellesley defeated a French army under King Joseph and Marshal Claude Victor Perrin. This was one of Wellesley's most brilliant victories and it earned him the title of Viscount Wellington. The Battle of Salamanca in 1812, where a British-Portuguese army under Wellington defeated a French army under Marshal Auguste de Marmont. This was a decisive victory that allowed Wellington to capture Madrid, and it forced King Joseph to flee. The Siege of Zaragoza between 1808 and 1809, where a Spanish garrison under General José de Plafox resisted two French sieges for several months before surrendering due to starvation and disease. The siege was marked by fierce fighting and heroic resistance by the defenders, who became symbols of Spanish patriotism. The siege of Badajoz in 1812, where a British-Portuguese army under Wellington stormed and captured fortified city held by a French garrison under General Armand Philippon. The siege was marked by brutal assaults and massacres by both sides and it cost Wellington many casualties. The Peninsular War ended with the Treaty of Paris in 1814, which restored Ferdinand VII as King of Spain and recognized the independence of Portugal. The war had a huge impact on both Spain and France. It drained their resources, killed hundreds of thousands of people, destroyed many cities and villages, and weakened their empires. It also had an impact on other regions, and inspired revolts in Latin America against Spanish colonial rule, it contributed to Napoleon's downfall by diverting his troops and attention from other fronts, and it enhanced Britain's prestige and influence as a liberator and ally. The Peninsular War was also a war that shaped the identity and history of Spain. It was a war that united the Spanish people against a common enemy and fostered a sense of patriotism and nationalism. It was also a war that divided the Spanish people between those who supported the French reforms and those who defended the traditional institutions. It was also a war that sparked a cultural and artistic movement, known as the Spanish Enlightenment, which produced some of the most famous works of Spanish literature, such as the Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes, and Spanish painting, such as the 3rd of May 1808 by Francisco Goya. We will talk about the Spanish-American War and the decline of Spain's overseas empire. This was a war that took place in 1898 between Spain and the United States and resulted in Spain losing most of its remaining colonies in the Americas and the Pacific. We will discuss how it started, who were the key personalities involved, what were the factors that led to Spain's defeat and what were the consequences of war for both countries. Let's begin. How did the Spanish-American War start? Well, it all started with Cuba a Spanish colony that had been fighting for its independence since 1868. Cuba was one of Spain's most valuable and profitable colonies, producing sugar, tobacco and coffee. However, it was also one of the most oppressed and exploited ones, suffering from high taxes, corruption, slavery and repression. The Cuban rebels, led by José Martí and Antonio Maceo, waged a guerrilla war against the Spanish colonial authorities who responded with brutal measures such as concentration camps, executions, and torture. The Cuban struggle for independence attracted the attention and sympathy of many Americans, who saw Cuba as a fellow republic fighting against a tyrannical empire. The American public was also influenced by the sensationalist newspapers that engaged in yellow journalism, which exaggerated and distorted the facts to stir up anti-Spanish sentiment. Some of these newspapers were owned by William Randolph Hearst, and Joseph Pulitzer, who competed for readership and profits by publishing lurid stories and images of Spanish atrocities in Cuba. The American government, led by President William McKinley, initially tried to avoid direct intervention in Cuba, hoping that Spain would grant Cuba more autonomy and reforms. However, 
The situation changed when two incidents occurred that outraged the American public and pushed the country towards war. The first incident was the publication of the DeLong letter in February 1898. This was a private letter written by Enrique Dupuy de Long, the Spanish ambassador to the United States, to a friend in Cuba. In the letter, de Long criticized McKinley as a weak and indecisive leader who was catering to the public opinion. The letter was stolen by a Cuban agent and leaked to her newspaper, which published it with a provocative headline, the worst insult to the United States in its history. The letter caused a diplomatic scandal and forced de Long to resign. The second incident was the sinking of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor on February 15, 1898. The Maine was a battleship that had been sent to Cuba to protect American citizens and interests after anti-Spanish riots broke out in Havana. The ship exploded and sank, killing 266 sailors. The cause of the explosion was unclear, but many Americans blamed Spain for sabotaging the ship. The newspapers fueled this suspicion with headlines such as Remember the Maine, to hell with Spain, the public demanded revenge and war. McKinley tried to calm down the situation by asking Spain for an armistice with Cuba and an investigation into the main incident. However, Spain refused to comply with all of McKinley's demands, and on April 11, 1898, McKinley asked Congress for authorization to use forces against Spain. Congress agreed and declared war on April 25th, retroactive to April 21. The Spanish-American War involved several key personalities on both sides. On the Spanish side, King Alfonso XIII, though the nominal ruler of Spain, was just 12 years old when he inherited the throne in 1886, ruling under the regency of his mother Maria Cristina until 1902. Prime Minister Praxades Mateo Sagasta, leader of the Liberal Party, was a prominent Spanish politician who attempted to negotiate a peaceful solution with the United States but failed to prevent or win the war. General Valeriano Weyler, known as the Butcher, governed Cuba from 1896 to 1897, implementing harsh policies against Cuban rebels, including concentration camps, executions and torture. He was recalled by Sagasta in 1897 after international pressure. Admiral Pascual Cervera, the commander of the Spanish naval squadron in the Caribbean, was ordered to sail from Spain to Cuba in 1898. Despite the inferiority of his ships and the risk of encountering the US Navy, he fought bravely at the Battle of Santiago de Cuba, where his fleet was ultimately destroyed by the US Navy. On the American side, President William McKinley, the 25th President of the United States from 1897 to 1901, was a moderate Republican who initially sought to avoid war with Spain. However, he was pressured by public opinion and Congress to intervene in Cuba, ultimately leading the United States to victory in the Spanish-American War and expanding its influence and territory overseas. Secretary of State John Hay played a crucial role as the chief diplomat from 1898 to 1905, negotiating the peace treaty with Spain and securing U.S. interests in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam and the Philippines. He also formulated the Open Door Policy, advocating free trade and equal access to China. Commander George Dewey, commander of the U.S. Naval Squadron in the Pacific, led a surprise attack on the Spanish fleet at Manila Bay in the Philippines on 1st May 1898, destroying the Spanish ships without losing a single American sailor. He also supported Filipino rebels led by Emilio Aguinaldo who declared independence from Spain. Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy and the leader of the Rough Riders, a volunteer cavalry unit, fought in Cuba. He resigned from his post to join the war and became famous for leading the charge up San Juan Hill on July 1st, 1898. Later, he served as the 26th President of the United States from 1901 to 1909. The factors contributing to Spain's loss of overseas territories were multifaceted. Spain faced military inferiority with outdated and poorly equipped forces compared to the modern weaponry and technology of the United States, which also had more troops and ships to defend its vast empire stretching from Cuba to the Philippines. Political instability plagued Spain, with internal conflicts and corruption weakening its government, while its colonies demanded more autonomy and rights. Spain's economy, dependent on colonies for raw materials and markets, suffered due to the high taxes and tariffs, leading to resentment and poverty among the colonists. Inflation, debt, and trade deficits further reduced Spain's resources and revenues. Morally, Spain's reputation suffered as it employed harsh treatment in its colonies, especially Cuba, 
where atrocities against nobles and civilians drew international condemnation. The Spanish-American War had profound consequences. For Spain, it marked the end of its overseas empire and great power status, losing most of its remaining colonies in America and Asia to the United States, along with a substantial indemnity payment. The war also triggered a political and social crisis in Spain known as the Disaster of 1998, leading to a series of reforms and revolutions aimed at modernizing and democratizing the nation. On the other hand, for the United States, it heralded the nation's emergence as a global power and imperialist force, gaining new territories and markets in America and Asia. The United States asserted its influence and interests in various regions, including Cuba and the Philippines. The war boosted the confidence and prestige of the United States, showcasing its military and diplomatic prowess to the world. In conclusion, the Spanish-American War stands as a pivotal moment in history that reshaped the destinies of Spain and the United States. It began with the aspirations of Cuban rebels for independence, as well as fueled by sensationalist journalism, diplomatic crisis, and the sinking of the USS Marine. The war featured a cast of key personalities, from King Alfonso XIII and Prime Minister Paraxed Mateo Sagasta on the Spanish side to President William McKinley and figures like Theodore Roosevelt on the American side. Spain's defeat can be attributed to factors including military inferiority, political instability, economic decline, and moral isolation. The consequences were profound, marking the end of Spain's colonial empire and the rise of the United States as a global power with new territories and influence. As we reflect on this historical conflict, it's a reminder of the complex interplay of politics, diplomacy, and human aspirations. The legacy of the Spanish-American War continues to shape the world we live in today. We will talk about the Spanish Civil War, which took place between 1936 and 1939. This was a war that pitted the Republicans and the Nationalists against each other in a struggle for the future of Spain. We will discuss how it started, what were the causes, factions and international involvement and what was the impact on Spanish society and politics. Let's begin. How did the Spanish Civil War start? Well, it all started with the Second Spanish Republic, which was established in 1931 after the abdication of King Alfonso XIII. The Republic was a democratic and progressive regime that aimed to modernize and reform Spain. It introduced measures such as universal suffrage, secular education, land redistribution, autonomy for Catalonia and the Basque country, and women's rights. However, it also faced many challenges and opposition from various sectors of Spanish society, such as the conservative elites, the Catholic Church, the army, the monarchists, the fascists, and the anarchists. The Republic also had to deal with a series of social and economic crises, such as the Great Depression, the Asturian Miners' Revolt of 1934, and the rise of political violence and polarization. The Republic was divided into two main coalitions, the Popular Front, which consisted of left-wing parties such as Socialists, Communists, Republicans and Separatists, and the National Front, which consisted of right-wing parties such as Conservatives, Nationalists, Catholics and Fascists. The tipping point came in February 1936, when the Popular Front won a narrow victory in the general elections. The National Front refused to accept the results and accused the Popular Front of fraud and corruption. They also plotted a coup d'etat to overthrow the Republic and restore order and stability. The coup was led by a group of generals who had the support of most of the army and some foreign powers. The coup began on July 17, 1936 in Spanish Morocco, where General Francisco Franco took command of the Army of Africa. The coup then spread to mainland Spain, where other generals such as Emilio Mola, José Sanjuru, Gonzalo Quipo de Lado, and Miguel Cabanelas joined the rebellion. The coup succeeded in taking control of some parts of Spain, such as Andalusia, Castilla León, Galicia, Navarre, Aragon, and Old Castile. However, the coup failed to take control of other parts of Spain, such as Madrid, Barcelona, Valencia, Asturias, Catalonia, and the Basque Country. These regions remained loyal to the Republic and resisted the rebels with the help of workers' militias, trade unions, political parties, and local authorities. The Republic also received support from some foreign powers, such as Mexico and the Soviet Union. The failure of the coup to achieve a quick victory led to a civil war that lasted for almost three years. The war was fought between two sides, the Republicans, who were also known as Loyalists or the Reds, 
who defended the Republic and its reforms, and the Nationalists, who were also known as rebels or just the whites, who fought for a new authoritarian regime under Franco's leadership. So what were the causes of the Spanish Civil War? There were many causes that contributed to the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. Some of them were the historical causes. So Spain had a long history of political instability, social inequality, regional diversity and external intervention. Spain had experienced several wars, revolutions, coups and dictatorships in its past. Spain also had a large empire that was gradually lost or challenged by other powers. These factors created a sense of frustration, resentment and division among the Spaniards. They were also ideological causes. So Spain was divided by different ideologies such as liberalism, conservatism, socialism, communism, anarchism, fascism, nationalism and separatism. These ideologies clash over issues such as democracy, religion, land, class, nation and culture. These ideologies also influenced or were influenced by international movements and events such as the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the rise of fascism in Italy and Germany and the Great Depression. There were also social causes. Spain had a complex and unequal social structure, composed of landowners, aristocrats, clergy, bourgeoisie, workers, peasants and minorities. These groups had different interests and demands that were often ignored or repressed by the state or each other. These groups also suffered from poverty, illiteracy, exploitation, oppression and discrimination. There were also economic causes. Spain had a backward and dependent economy that relied on agriculture, mining and a colonial trade. Spain also faced low productivity and high unemployment which resulted in inflation, debt and trade deficits. Spain also lacked industrialization, modernization and development. And of course there were political causes. So Spain had a weak and corrupt political system that was dominated by two parties, the liberals and the conservatives who alternated in power through a system of electoral fraud, patronage and coercion. Spain also had a dysfunctional parliament, a divided government and a disloyal army and a controversial monarchy. These causes created a situation of crisis and conflict that led to the Spanish Civil War. However, the war was not inevitable. It was also the result of human choices and actions that could have been different. The war was also influenced by external factors that could have been prevented or changed. The war was, in short, a complex and tragic event that had multiple and interrelated causes. So, what were the factions and international involvement in the Spanish Civil War? The Spanish Civil War was not only a war between two sides, but also a war within each side. The war involved many factions and actors that had their own agendas and interests. The war also involved many foreign powers and volunteers that intervened or supported one side or the other. Here are some of the main factions and actors involved in the Spanish Civil War. So on the Republican side, some of the main factions were the Popular Front. This was a coalition of left-wing parties that won the 1936 elections and formed the government of the Republic. It included Socialists, Communists, Republicans and Separatists. It was led by Manuel Azania, Francisco Larga Caballero, Juan Negrin, Indalecio Prito, Vicente Rojo, and Jose Miaja. The Anarchists, this was the movement of workers and peasants who advocated for a radical social revolution based on self-management, direct democracy, and mutual aid. They rejected any form of authority or hierarchy. They were organized in trade unions such as the CNT, the National Confederation of Labor, and the FAI, Iberian Anarchist Federation. They were led by Buena Ventura Duruti, Francisco Ascaso, Federica Monseni, and Juan Garcia Oliver. They were also the Catalan Nationalists. This was a movement of Catalans who sought more autonomy or independence from Spain. They had their own government, known as the Generalitat de Catalunya, which had its own parliament, police, army, and language. They were led by Luis Companis, Frances Macia, Josep Taradelas, and Josep Ilna. The Basque Nationalists This was the movement of Basques who sought more autonomy or independence from Spain. They had their own government, known as the Eusco Guadalustea, which had its own parliament, police, army and language. They were led by José Antonio Aguirre, Manuel de Erujo, José María de Areza, and Leiza Ola. On the national side, some of the main factions were the Falange, 
This was the fascist party that advocated for a totalitarian state based on nationalism, corporatism and Catholicism. It rejected democracy, liberalism, socialism and separatism. It was inspired by Italian fascism and German Nazism. It was led by José Antonio Primo de Rivera until his execution in 1936, Manuel Hedida until his arrest in 1937, and Francisco Franco, who merged with other right-wing parties in 1937. The Carlists This was the monarchist movement supported the claim of Don Carlos to the Spanish throne. They rejected the Bourbon dynasty and advocated for a traditional state based on feudalism, regionalism, and Catholicism. They were organized in militias known as Riquestes, or CT, Traditionalist Communion. They were led by Manuel Falconde, Tomás Domínguez Arevalo, José María de Oriol y Urcuijo, and Rafael García Valinho, the CEDA. This was the coalition of conservative parties that opposed the republic and its reforms. It supported a constitutional monarchy based on capitalism, nationalism, and Catholicism. It was led by José María Guedrubíes y Quiñones until his exile in 1936, Joaquín Chapa Prieta until his resignation in 1936, Antonio Guaycochea until his arrest in 1936, and José Calvo Sotelo until his assassination in 1936. The Renovación Española This was another monarchist movement that supported the claim of Alfonso XIII to the Spanish throne. They rejected both Carlist traditionalism and Republican liberalism. They advocated for a modern state based on capitalism, nationalism, and Catholicism. They were led by Antonio Maura, José Calvo Sotelo, and José María Guilrubéas y Quiñones after his return from exile in 1938. Their international involvement in the Spanish Civil War was also significant, as many foreign powers and volunteers intervened or supported one side or the other. Some of them were the Soviet Union, it supported the Republic with military aid such as weapons, planes, tanks and advisors, and also sent volunteers such as the International Brigades, which consisted of about 40,000 fighters from various countries who fought for the Republican cause. However, Soviet aid also came with a price. It increased the influence and control of the Communist Party in the Republic, and it provoked the hostility and intervention of Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy. Nazi Germany it also supported the nationalists with military aid such as weapons, planes, tanks and advisors. It also sent volunteers such as the Condor Legion, which consisted of about 10,000 German pilots and soldiers who fought for the nationalist cause. The Condor Legion was responsible for some of the most notorious atrocities of the war, such as the bombing of Guernica in 1937, which killed hundreds of civilians and inspired Pablo Picasso's famous painting. Fascist Italy it supported the nationalists with military aid such as weapons, planes, tanks, and also advisors. It also sent volunteers, such as the Corpo Truppe Volontari, the Volunteer Corps, which consisted of about 80,000 Italian troops who fought for the nationalist cause. The Italian aid was crucial for Franco's victory in some battles, such as Teruel in 1937 and Ebro in 1938. France It initially supported the Republic with moral and diplomatic aid, but later adopted a policy of non-intervention due to internal and external pressures. It also closed its border with Spain in 1937, which prevented the Republic from receiving more aid and volunteers. However, some French politicians and intellectuals, such as Leon Blum and Andrea Malraux, continued to support the Republic privately or publicly. Britain it also adopted a policy of non-intervention due to its appeasement of Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy. It also imposed an arms embargo on both sides of the war, which hurt the Republic more than the Nationalists. However, some British politicians and intellectuals, such as Winston Churchill and George Orwell, criticized the non-intervention policy and supported the Republic personally or professionally. The United States it also adopted a policy of non-intervention due to its isolationism and neutrality. It also imposed an arms embargo on both sides of the war, which hurt the Republic more than the Nationalists. However, some American politicians and intellectuals, such as Franklin D. Roosevelt and Ernest Hemingway, sympathized with the Republic and denounced the fascist aggression. Some Americans also joined the international brigades or other humanitarian organizations to help the Republic. So what was the impact of the Spanish Civil War on Spanish society and politics? Well, the Spanish Civil War had a profound impact. Some of its effects were the human losses, 
The war killed about a half a million people, including soldiers, civilians and refugees. The war also wounded, imprisoned, exiled or disappeared many more people. The war also caused famine, disease and trauma among the survivors. There were also material losses. The war destroyed many cities, villages and infrastructures, such as roads, bridges, railways and factories. The war also damaged or looted many cultural, historical and artistic heritages, such as churches, monuments, museums and libraries. There were obviously social changes as well. The war altered the social structure and composition of Spain. The war increased the urbanization, the migration, the literacy and the emancipation of some groups, such as workers, women and minorities. The war also decreased the influence and wealth on the population of other groups, such as landowners, aristocrats, clergy and rural communities. There were political changes. The war ended with Franco's victory in 1939, which marked the beginning of his dictatorship until his death in 1975. Franco abolished the Republic and its reforms and imposed a totalitarian state based on nationalism, corporatism, Catholicism and anti-communism. Franco also suppressed any opposition or dissent with censorship, propaganda, repression, torture and execution. Franco also isolated Spain from most of the international community until after World War II. King Juan Carlos and the Transition to Democracy So King Juan Carlos was the grandson of King Alfonso XIII, who had left Spain in 1931 after the proclamation of the Second Spanish Republic. Juan Carlos was born in Rome in 1938 and spent most of his childhood and youth in exile. He returned to Spain in 1948 under the invitation of Franco, who saw him as a potential successor. Juan Carlos received a military education and swore loyalty to the Francoist regime. However, Juan Carlos also had contacts with some opposition leaders and foreign diplomats, who encouraged him to play a positive role in the future of Spain. Juan Carlos was aware of the need for political change and social modernization in Spain, and he secretly prepared for a democratic transition. Juan Carlos became king on November 22, 1975, two days after Franco's death. He faced a difficult situation, as he had to balance the expectations of different political forces such as the French Swiss, who wanted to preserve the authoritarian regime, the opposition, who wanted to restore democracy and civil rights, and the army, who wanted to maintain order and stability. Juan Carlos surprised many by appointing Adolfo Suarez as Prime Minister in July 1976. Suarez was a young and moderate politician, who had served under Franco, but who was also committed to reform. Suarez and Juan Carlos worked together to dismantle the French Swiss institution and to legalize political parties trade unions and regional autonomy. They also promoted a political reform act that was approved by referendum in December 1976. The act allowed for free and fair elections for a constituent assembly that would draft a new constitution. The first democratic elections since 1936 were held in June 1977. They were won by Suarez's party, the Union of the Democratic Center UCD. The constituent assembly was composed of representatives from various political forces such as socialists, communists, conservatives, nationalists, and regionalists. They reached a consensus on a new constitution that was approved by referendum in December 1978. The constitution established Spain as a parliamentary monarchy with a bicameral legislature, a prime minister, and a constitutional court. It also recognized the rights and freedoms of citizens, as well as the autonomy of regions and nationalities. The transition to democracy was not without difficulties and challenges. There were several attempts to destabilize or reverse the process by some sectors of the French Swiss regime or the army. The most serious one was the attempted coup d'etat on February 23, 1981, when a group of armed officers stormed into the Congress of Deputies and held the deputies hostage. The coup failed thanks to the decisive intervention of King Juan Carlos, who appeared on television and condemned the coup as illegitimate. He also ordered the army to respect the constitutional order and to remain loyal to him as commander-in-chief. The king's speech was crucial to end the coup and to consolidate democracy in Spain. Since the transition to democracy, Spain has experienced significant social, economic and cultural changes. Spain has also become integrated into the European Union and the international community. Spain has also faced some challenges and problems such as terrorism, corruption, unemployment and regional tensions. The political landscape in Spain has also evolved over time. 
the first democratic governments were led by Adolfo Suarez and Leopoldo Calvo Sotelo of the UCD, a centrist party that dissolved in 1983 due to internal divisions. The UCD was replaced by the PSOE, a socialist party that governed from 1982 to 1996 under Felipe González. The PSOE implemented important reforms such as the entry into NATO, the accession to the European Economic Community, the modernization of infrastructure, and the expansion of the welfare state. However, the PSOE also faced some scandals such as the GAL, anti-ETA debt squads, the Felici case, illegal financing, and the roll-down case, embezzlement. The PSOE lost power in 1996 to the PP, a conservative party that governed from 1996 to 2004 under José María Aznar. The PP continued some of the PSOE's policies such as the adoption of the euro, the liberalization of the economy, and the fight against terrorism. However, the PP also introduced some controversial measures, such as the labor reform, the education reform, and the support for the US-led invasion of Iraq. The PP lost popularity after the 2004 Madrid train bombings, which were initially blamed on ETA, but later attributed to Islamist terrorists. The PP was replaced by PSOE, which returned to power from 2004 to 2011 under José Luis Rodríguez Zapatero. The PSOE implemented some progressive reforms such as the legalization of same-sex marriage, the withdrawal of troops from Iraq, the expansion of renewable energy, and the recognition of historical memory. However, the PSOE also faced some difficulties such as the economic crisis, the rise of unemployment, the social protests, and the increase in regional demands. The PSOE lost power in 2011 to the PP, which governed again from 2011 to 2018 under Mariano Rajoy. The PP applied some austerity measures such as the budget cuts, the tax increases, and the pension reform. The PP also had faced some challenges such as the corruption cases the Catalan independence referendum, and the motion of no confidence. The PP was replaced by the PSOE, which has been in power since 2018 under Pedro Sanchez. The PSOE formed a coalition government with Unidas Podemos, a left-wing party that emerged from the 15M movement and the anti-austerity protests. The PSOE Podemos government had pursued some policies such as the increase of minimum wage, the repeal of labor reform, and the exhumation of Franco's remains. However, the PSOE Podemos government had also faced some obstacles such as the COVID-19 pandemic, the economic recession, and the Catalan conflict. World War I was a war that broke out in 1914 between two alliances, the Triple Entente, composed of France, Britain, and Russia, and the Triple Alliance, composed of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. The war was triggered by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria in Sarajevo by a Serbian nationalist. The war soon spread to other regions of the world, such as Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Spain declared its neutrality in World War I on August 7, 1914, by a royal decree of King Alfonso XIII. Spain had several reasons to stay out of the war. It had historical reasons, such as Spain had a long history of political instability, social inequality, regional diversity, and external intervention. Spain had experienced several wars, revolutions, coups, and dictatorships in its past. Spain also had a large empire that was gradually lost or challenged by other powers. These factors created a sense of frustration, resentment, and division among Spaniards. Ideological reasons Spain was divided by different ideologies such as liberalism, conservatism, socialism, communism, anarchism, fascism, nationalism, and separatism. These ideologies clashed over issues such as democracy, religion, land, class, nation, and culture. These ideologies also influenced or were influenced by international movements and events such as the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the rise of fascism in Italy and Germany, and the Great Depression. Spain also had a complex and unequal social structure, composed of landowners, aristocrats, clergy, bourgeoisie, workers, peasants, and minorities. These groups had different interests and demands that were often ignored or repressed by the state or each other. These groups also suffered from poverty, illiteracy, exploitation, oppression, and discrimination. Spain had a backward and dependent economy that relied on agriculture, mining, and colonial trade. Spain also faced low productivity high unemployment, inflation, debt, and trade deficits. 
Spain also lacked industrialization, modernization, and development. Spain had a weak and corrupt political system that was dominated by two parties, the liberals and the conservatives, who alternated in power through a system of electoral fraud, patronage, and coercion. Spain also had a dysfunctional parliament, a divided government, and a disloyal army. Strategic reasons were also a big part. Spain had no direct interest or threat in the war zones. Spain was far from the main battlefields, located on the Franco-German border, Northern Italy, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. Spain also had no strong alliances or obligations with any of the belligerents. Spain's only formal pact with the France and the Britain signed in 1907 to prevent German expansion in North Africa. However, this pact was not binding in case of war. Spain also feared that joining the war would expose its colonies and territories to enemy attacks or invasions. Despite its neutrality, Spain was not unaffected by World War I. They had some positive and negative impacts on Spain. So, there were positive impacts, such as the economic boom. The war created a huge demand for Spanish exports, such as food, minerals, textiles, and weapons. Spain also benefited from the influx of foreign capital, investment, and tourism. Spain's trade balance improved significantly during the war years. There was also social progress. The war stimulated some social changes in Spain, such as urbanization, migration, literacy, and emancipation of some groups, such as workers, women, and minorities. The war also increased the social awareness and mobilization of some sectors of society, such as trade unions, political parties, and cultural associations. International prestige was also one of them. The war enhanced Spain's international role and reputation as a neutral country that could mediate between the warning parties. Spain also participated in some humanitarian initiatives to help prisoners of war, refugees, and victims of the war. Spain also hosted some important diplomatic meetings and conferences during the war years. Now, what were the negative impacts on Spain? The war aggravated some political problems in Spain, such as corruption, violence, polarization, and regionalism. The war also exposed the weakness and incompetence of government and the monarchy which failed to address the social and economic challenges of the war. The war also provoked some political movements and conflicts such as the Catalan nationalism, the Rift War, and the 1923 coup d'etat. There was also a lot of social unrest. The war worsened some social problems in Spain such as poverty, inequality, exploitation, and oppression. The war also caused some social tensions and protests such as strikes, riots, demonstrations, and revolts. The war also increased the radicalization and violence of some groups, such as the anarchists, communists, and the separatists. There was a big economic collapse. The war ended with a severe economic crisis in Spain. As foreign markets and capital dried up, Spain also faced a huge inflation, a public debt, and a trade deficit. Spain also suffered from a shortage of raw materials, energy, and food. Spain also experienced a social and political instability that hampered its recovery and development. World War II was a war that broke out in 1939 between two alliances. The Allies, composed of Britain, France, the United States, Soviet Union and others. And the Axis, composed of Germany, Italy, Japan and others. The war was triggered by the Germanic invasion of Poland in September 1939. The war soon spread to other regions of the world, such as Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. Spain declared its neutrality in World War II on September 5, 1939. By a decree of General Francisco Franco, Spain had several reasons to stay out of the war. Spain had just emerged from a devastating civil war that lasted from 1936 to 1939. The civil war was a war between two sides, the Republicans, who defended the democratic Second Spanish Republic and its reforms, and the Nationalists, who fought for a new authoritarian regime under Franco's leadership. The civil war killed about half a million people, and wounded, imprisoned, exiled, or disappeared many more. The civil war also caused famine, disease, and trauma among the survivors. Spain was divided by different ideologies, such as fascism, nationalism, Catholicism, and anti-communism. These ideologies aligned with the Axis powers who had supported Franco during the Civil War. However, these ideologies also clashed with some aspects of the Nazi ideology, such as racism, anti-Semitism, and paganism. Franco also had some personal differences with Hitler and Mussolini, 
such as his pride, his independence, and his ambition. Spain had a complex and diverse social structure, composed of different regions, languages, cultures, and identities. Some of these groups had their own aspirations or grievances that were not satisfied by Franco's regime. Some of these groups also sympathized with or opposed different belligerents in the war. For example, the Basques and the Catalans favored the Allies because they hoped for more autonomy or independence from Spain. The Carlists and the Falanges favored the Axis because they hoped for more influence or expansion in Spain. Spain had a poor and dependent economy that relied on imports from abroad. Spain also faced a huge debt, a trade imbalance, and a scarcity of resources. Spain also lacked industrialization, modernization, and development. Spain also depended on some countries that were at war or under blockade for its supplies. For example, Spain imported oil from the United States, wheat from Canada, iron from Sweden, and tungsten from Portugal. Spain had a fragile and isolated political system that was challenged by internal and external pressures. Spain also faced some threats or opportunities that could affect its neutrality or security. For example, the Gibraltar question. Gibraltar was a British territory located at the southern tip of Spain that controlled the entrance to the Mediterranean Sea. Spain had claimed Gibraltar since 1704, when it was captured by Britain during the War of Spanish Succession. Spain wanted to recover Gibraltar either by negotiation or by force. However, Britain refused to cede Gibraltar and defended it with its naval power. Franco considered Gibraltar as a strategic asset that could help him build his colonial empire in Africa or join the Axis powers in exchange for help. The French question France was a neighboring country that shared a long border with Spain. France was also a former ally of Spain that had supported the Republic during the Civil War. France was invaded by Germany in June 1940 and divided into two zones, an occupied zone under Nazi control and a free zone under Vichy control. Franco considered France as a potential enemy or ally that could affect his interests or plans. Franco wanted to take advantage of France's weakness to obtain some territories such as the French Morocco, the French Algeria, or the French Cameroon. However, Franco also feared that France could become a battleground for the Allies and the Axis, or a base for the resistance movements. The Portuguese question. Portugal was a neighboring country that shared a long border with Spain. Portugal was also a historical ally of Spain that had signed the Treaty of Friendship and Non-Aggression in 1939. Portugal was neutral in World War II but it had some ties with Britain and the United States. Franco considered Portugal as a partner or a rival that could affect his interests or plans. Franco wanted to maintain good relations with Portugal to secure his supplies of tungsten, a strategic metal used for weapons and ammunition. However, Franco also wanted to pressure Portugal to join the Axis powers or to cede some territories such as the Portuguese Guinea or the Capiverde Islands. Despite its neutrality, Spain was not unaffected by World War II. The war had some positive and negative impacts on Spain. The positive impacts were, such as the economic recovery. The war created some opportunities for Spain to improve its economy. Spain exploited its neutrality to trade with both sides of the war, especially with Germany and Italy. Spain also received some payments and concessions from Germany and Italy in exchange for its cooperation or assistance. Spain also benefited from the American aid program known as Lent Lease, which provided Spain with food, oil, and machinery. There was also a big diplomatic influence. The war enhanced Spain's diplomatic role and reputation as a neutral country that could mediate between the warring parties. Spain also participated in some international organizations and initiatives, such as the United Nations, the Red Cross, and the Vatican. Spain also hosted some important diplomatic meetings and conferences during the war years. However, the negative impacts were such as the political isolation. The war isolated Spain from most of the international community. Especially after the defeat of the Axis powers in 1945, Spain was seen as a fascist regime that had collaborated with Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Spain was excluded from some international organizations and agreements, such as the Marshall Plan, the NATO, and the European Coal and Steel Community. Spain also faced some sanctions and boycotts from some countries, such as France, Britain, and the United States. There was also social unrest. 
The war worsened some social problems in Spain such as poverty, inequality, exploitation and oppression. The war also caused some social tensions and protests such as strikes, riots, demonstrations and revolts. The war also increased the radicalization and violence of some groups such as communists, socialists, anarchists and separatists. Well, this concludes our video on Spain's involvement in World War I and World War II. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you did, please like this video and subscribe to our channel for more videos on Spanish history. Thank you for watching and as always, keep revisiting the archive.